Uh, Vipassana meditation and Samatha meditation are two aspects of the many and various uh, forms of meditation described by the, 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 the Buddha and also in the various different um, uh, meditation monasteries that you find in, in Southeast Asia. Samatha is the Pali spelling pronunciation and Vipassana. So uh, uh, Samatha means um, uh, calmness or settledness. Um, and so that Samatha meditation is really to do with that collecting of attention and developing the quality of calm, peacefulness and the f focus of attention. So with uh, Samatha meditation, there's a, a usually taking a single object like the rhythm of the breath, it could be a mantra, it could be a visualization, um, or, the, uh, or a walking meditation, you use the feeling of your feet as you walk along the ground. These are, are uh, I say, the, the general methods for summative practice. You take a single sensory object, um, uh, either external, like the feeling of your footsteps, or internal, like a, a, an internal mantra or a, a, an imagined visual form. And you, that is a single point that you focus the attention on and deliberately exclude everything else. So, say for example, you would, uh, in some of the practice, you'd say, okay, for the next 45 minutes, the only thing I'm interested in is the rhythm of my breath. That's uh, everything else can wait. That's the one thing. And if the, if the attention drifts from the breath, then uh, being aware of that, then there's a letting go of that and coming back to, to the, the breath again. So some of the practice is uh, a training in one-pointedness. And that one-pointedness leads to an, an integration of the whole system and a sense of settledness and ease and focus. It diminishes the habits of the mind of distraction, you know, being caught up in, in memory and imagination and uh, uh, planning and, and uh, distracted thinking, uh, conceptual thought and such like. So it's a, a, a settling and focusing of attention and that's its point. Uh, so it's a it's a, um, a a way of training the mind to uh, attend fully to the present through the agency of a single sensory object. You're using that as a means to bring the attention to the present reality, but you're deliberately excluding a vast array of the rest of the experiential field. So vipassana uh, meditation traditionally, uh, and how I've usually practiced it, uh, is where when there is that quality of settledness, that one-pointedness in the present is established, then you deliberately let go of that single object of the breath or of the footsteps or whatever, and you broaden the focus of attention. So there's a, a conscious dropping of the um, exclusion principle. You know, you're not, it's not just the point that excludes everything else, but you're in a sense widening the point to be the point that includes. And so that it's still a one-pointed attention, but the point includes the whole experiential uh, reality. Vipassana literally means uh, in uh, looking inwards or seeing inwardly. V meaning in, in, in this instance, meaning inward. Apacity is the verb to see, so looking inward, insight or introspection. To another, use another word is exactly as introspection is the same as vipassana or insight. So that. Um, uh, purpose of, uh, of Vipassana then is to, uh, by broadening the field of attention, to then uh, disentangle the, the awareness from the content of experience to know the process of experiencing. Um, so that you're, uh, you're opening the, the attention to the whole field of experience and uh, letting go of all of the objects to train the mind to rest in the subject, as it were, in the, that uh, awakened, uh, aware quality, and to be the knowing, or to embody or that, that knowing, aware quality that receives sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thought, memory, imagination, emotion, etc., as it arises, takes shape, and, and dissolves. So it's a, it's a way of being one-pointedly aware in the present, but without focusing on any specific object. Now, the, as 
uh, probably everyone who's watching this uh, and listening to this is aware, the mind snags on various different objects. Thoughts that arise, particular visual forms, things that we taste or smell or touch, that something catches the attention. Uh, a, a particular thought or an, a, a, a plan, a memory, um, a sensation in the body, and then uh, rather than resting in the awareness of, of that, the, the, the mind goes, oh, my knee is beginning to hurt, or oh my goodness, I'm supposed to write that email. Um, and so it, the, the attention has got latched onto, has been born into that particular thought or feeling or sound or, or, or visual form. Uh, so uh, to counteract that tendency of the mind to get caught up in the content of experience uh, you know, and to, to lose that objectivity, that disentangled uh, knowing, that unentangled knowing of, of the flow of experience, uh, we use three standard reflections on, on uh, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and not-self. So uh, the, the Eightfold Path is part of the, the Buddha's first discourse, and this analysis of, of anicca, dukkha, anatta, of unsatisfactoriness, or an uncertain, a change or uncertainty, and not self, that uh, is derived from the Buddha's second discourse, at least according to the Pali Canon, the, what's called the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the discourse on not self. And so when the Buddha is described, trying to explain his understanding to his five companions in the deer park in, uh, in Varanasi, he makes this sort of a, he takes an analytical approach. He makes this um, series of questions with his five friends, and he says, "So, material form, rupa, is that in a state of change or not? Nichangwa anichangwati." Uh, and they say, "It's in a state of change. It's anicca." So, that which is in a state of change, can that be fully satisfying, or is it unsatisfactory? Is it subject to affliction or not subject to affliction? Well, if it's in a state of change, necessarily it can't satisfy all the time. It's subject to affliction. It's unsatisfactory. And then the Buddha says, so, if the rupa, if the material form is in a state of change, is unsatisfactory, is it appropriate to say of material form, etang mama eso hamasmi eso me atati, this is mine, this is what I am, this is myself. No, hey, Tang Bante, no, it's not. So he uses this analytical method to explore the nature of experience. Okay, so then if, if the material form, if your body is uh, in a state of change, is unsatisfactory, then it can't be, uh, who, uh, it can't be a true self. On, and that, that analysis is based on the, the principle that a true self, the Atman or the Atta, would be would be permanent and blissful, <laughs> and what, who and what you really are. So it being sort of Nietzsche, Sukha, and Atta, or, or in using the, the Vedic or Upanishadic structure, Sat, Chit, Ananda, being consciousness bliss is the sort of the nature of the Atman. And so I say, well, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's in a state of change and it's, not bl- and it's not permanent and blissful, it can't be a, a real Atta, it can't be the real Atman. So he uses this analytical approach and Vipassana meditation uses the same kind of uh, core principles. Uh, so if you have a memory of, like, uh, of something, well, rather than, okay, that's a sweet memory or a bitter memory, is it changing? Uh, it, uh, if it's a sweet memory, uh, yeah, but can this, uh, can this satisfy me forever? If I keep thinking of this for the next 10 hours, will it still be sweet? But no, it'll be really boring. <laughs> Therefore, uh, 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 is this truly, truly who and what you are? Is this something that can really be said to be uh, owned by, by some quality here? So that the, uh, the process of vipassana, you're not just repeating the words anicca, dukkha, anatta, or you know, uh, change, unsatisfaction, it's not self. It's not like a mantra. It's an actual, it's like a set of tools that you're using to, to uh, like a, a set of sort of screwdrivers and uh, and and uh, wrenches to open up an engine, you know, actually a, a toolkit to open things, open things up in terms of how the mind works. So the point being that things that we habitually take to be ourself, the body, uh, I am hearing, I am seeing, I think, I feel, I'm, I'm choosing, I'm deciding, um, uh, that uh, I, I love, I hate, I'm, I'm anxious, you know, 
Uh, all those I am's, I have, I am, uh, I, I, you know, this is me, this is my name, this is my story. It's a way of challenging those habitual I am's. And, and then they're not trying to make uh, the mind believe it's something else, but rather it's bursting those bubbles of presumption uh, that, uh, uh, that form, I, I'm the body, I'm the personality, uh, I'm a male, I'm a human being, I'm a Theravadan Buddhist monk. And the mind that takes those as absolute realities, it's just burst, popping those bubbles, bursting those, those bubbles. And so then what remains, the, there's the vipassana as the practice, those application, the application of those reflections. Then uh, the vipassana as the actual insight is the, oh, of course, how can that be who and what I am? That which knows the body changing, that which knows feelings or perceptions changing, that which knows moods and emotions changing, that is not a person. It doesn't belong to a person. It's aware, it's awake, it knows. Even calling it an it is not quite right. <laughs> but this awake, aware quality, it knows the personal, but it's not, it's not personal. It's not a person in and of itself. Aha! So the vipassana as an experience is that aha. It's that quality of freedom of heart, that utter simplicity. That's the vipassana as a change of heart, as a quality of being. So it's important in terms of vipassana, it's not just a practice, it's not just a set of instructions, that's sort of part of it, but it also it's referring to that change of view, that change of attitude, and that's uh, the most important element of it.